We have come again at an appointed time. to worship a God of appointments. The very fact that we are here gathered is an indication that God is real. When talking to the philosophers in Acts 17, Paul said in regarding God that in him we live and move and have our being. The very fact that we have being is an indication that he has been, that he is because we are. And so we are thankful to God. Good to see Frank and Beverly out today, and all of you. You know, when we look at the notion of the resolution in people to come. One does not have to be in perfect health to show that resolution. It's a mind thing. It is a thing that drives, a thing that has to do with the will of man. Knowledge is important, but will exceeds knowledge and importance. One can have all the knowledge in the world, but not the will to do it. So all of you who have come today, we are gaining in population every Sunday. We want to thank the brethren for all they do, all the sacrifices they make. None of these things will be taken lightly. All the sisters, all that you do. It is a hope that we can get that van going again, but there is a need for drivers. There are a need for people to say, hey, I, I need a ride. I, you know, I need, you know. Sisters, we're not excluding you from driving the van. If you can drive it, drive on. You know? We don't want to hinder anything. We want to make certain that all that we can do for God, we do it. The Bible says this, that we ought to not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, you will reap if you faint not. I want to talk to you this morning about the 17th, uh, actually, not the 17th, but 2 Corinthians chapter 3, which has 17 verses. 17 verses. Now, is it possible to take 17 verses and in a span of 35 minutes elucidate on all of these verses? I, th I think we can do that. I think we can do that cover verses, perhaps one every two minutes and still make that time. When we look at what the third chapter of 2 Timothy is about, it has to do with preparation. The 17 verses of 2 Timothy 3 are designed to equip the Christian in preparedness. The very idea of preparedness is an indication of troublesome times. I want, to, I want you to grasp this. We are in. They are not about to come. They are here. Now we can be like the ostrich and put our head in the sand and say, well, they're not here. They're still on the way but we're just deluding ourselves. Yes. The very idea of preparedness is indicative of the fact that we are in tough times. You see, 
we indeed are in troubled times. I dare say that none can see these things better than the Christian. The world may sense that we are in troubled times, but they are so enveloped in these troubled times. They are so enveloped in this mess, this sin, this carnal aggravation. They are swept in it. They are buried under it. And they see no way of getting out of it unless we act to show them the way. It is easy to curse the world, to curse those that are caught in it. But I want to remind you of something. We ourselves were where they are. It's easy to point a finger. Look at the wino on the corner. I want you to understand something. There was a time when we were the wino on the corner. Look at this guy chasing that woman. There was a time when we were original gangsters out there. So I, I, I want you to understand something that every time you point your finger at somebody, you have three pointing back at you. These are troubled times. And there is no sense in us walking around as if things are all right. I'm saved, you go for yourself. That is not the Christian attitude. I thought for sure that I had my glasses with me, but I don't. John, would you get, I brought two glasses just in case, or two pairs of glasses. Oh, there you go. But I want you to understand, church, that this is nothing to play. I want you to understand that because things happened the way they did yesterday, there's no indication that the day is going to be the same. The Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. What we ought to pray for is that we be equal to whatever comes, so that that equality that comes by God's grace will enable us to endure. See, that's what we ought to be praying for. Uh, forget about the bigger house. Forget, forget about the newer car. For, forget about uh, going from just on the line to management. <laughs> If these things are to be, they will be. But for right now, in as much as we are in troubled times, we better behave like it. We better behave like it. Kids going to school. Oh, yeah, there's the bullying going on. But too often we ourselves are caught up in ourselves that these things take a back burner. Sometimes we are so caught up in how we want to get to some place rather than the place we ought to get to. I'm, I'm talking about preparation for these difficult times today. Some folk ain't prepared. Some folk ain't prepared. We think we're prepared. But we're not. Yes. I made a note here. You see, as those trying to distance themselves from that enslavement of sin by walking after the spirit. For God has delivered us from sin's practice. We are astonished at the condition of those altogether given to sin shut under and enveloped their oxygen church you know what their oxygen is their oxygen is lust of the eyes 
lust of the flesh, pride of life. That is what they breathe in. And let me tell you, they are waiting to exhale. What are they exhaling? All the good principles that mother and father taught them. They are no longer important. They are exhaled. Whereas what is inhaled? The world. We inhale it. We breathe it. That is our oxygen. Our carbon dioxide are the principles of God. Breathe it out. Who cares? There's a sad note in scripture. A sad note. If you die in your sin, Jesus said, where I am, you can wear all the cross that you want. Get the cross earrings, get the cross necklace, the bracelet, have blessed on your car. Jesus said, where I am, you cannot come. I, I want to just venture just a minute. Oh, I like the way that time is back there. That long hand, Brother Eddie, is meddling the side of the clock, which means I have a little time. When you look at Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31, there is an obvious fact that comes to mind. And that is that once you leave here, you could have a million saints praying for you. Day and night. A million saints praying for you. And guess what? Your condition will not be changed. No change. That great goal that is fixed will still be there. All the agony and moaning will change nothing. We need to understand something that we are a second away from that event. A second, one second away. We are a breath away from that unchangeable event. These 86,400 seconds we really have. Ah. Let me tell you something. Every one of them is a gift of God. Don't think that you deserve a single second. Peter said in his second epistle, he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. Do you hear that? Long suffering. Paul, in addressing the church at Corinth, said in First Corinthians thirteen chapter, uh, thirteen chapter four, verse, that love suffers long and is kind. That's God. That's why you're here today. You want to know why you're here today? Let me give you a biblical truth. Because God is long suffering. We are here because He's long suffering. We are here because that stuff we still got to work out. Don't worry about somebody else working your stuff out. You get your game into play. Get your game into play. And, and stop striking out. Some folks don't even want to come up to the batter's cage, to the batter's box. They don't want the ball picked. Because that means it got to work. Go ahead and swing that bat. Swing that bat. Hit that ball. If you get on first base, that's okay, Brother Eddie. That's all right. You know why? Because the man that has one talent can make two. What about if you get a double? That's all right. Now you're on second base. Now, if you play the game right, you can make it home. Because if you own two and you get two, you're home. 
What about the man with the five talents? That's all right. <clears throat> Pray for the one that got the five, y'all. I'm serious. Because he got a lot more responsibility to get to where he's going. If you love him, you'll pray for him. And not just not the brother, but the sisters too. Brothers ain't the ones only that got the one, two, and five talents. Sisters got the one, two, and five talents. Oh, yeah. Preparedness. Yeah, we can walk in here. But what is, it's one thing walking in here. It's another thing walking out there. Down here, we got mm, a sense of safety. But out there, that's where it's real. On the job. That's where it's real. At the store. In the neighborhood. With your neighbors. At the school. That's where it gets real. You see. And if you ain't prepared. Too often we're going to come up here saying, brothers and sisters, I have sinned. And we're sitting over the same thing again and again and again. Why? Because we're not prepared. We're not prepared. Yes. You know, and I'm going to move through these 17 verses quite Judiciously, methodically, and with a speed that is not going to take away from what the scripture is saying. I want you to understand that I want to look at five things. I want to look at the sin. I want to look at the suffering. I want to look at the seducers. I want to look at the stability. I want to look at the scripture. You see, the sin deals with verses one through nine. Okay, the suffering deals with verses 10 through 12. The seducers deals with 13. The stability deals with 14 and 15. And the scriptures deal with verses 16 and 17. Is that all right? You see, the sin, the sin. You see, we can put that word in that three letter word in our pocket. The sin. What you got in your pocket, Martin? Sin. Do you want to keep it in your pocket, Martin? No. What do you want to do? Overcome it. But I, I, I want you to know that as long as you're on this earth, you're going to have it in your pocket. Paul said there's a law that when I would do good, evil is present. But wait a minute, Paul. You're talking about before you were converted, right? No, I'm talking about after I'm converted. I still got it to deal with. I still got it to deal with. It's still a problem. I don't want it to be a problem. It's not my intent for it to be a problem, but it's a problem. What do you do? I carry it with me every day. I try to keep it in the pocket. Sometimes when it comes out, I don't have the strength to push it back in. We're talking about sin. Now, sin does not necessarily mean that your character is bad. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, he says, he says I delight in the law of God after the inner man, but I see another law. What is it? It's in my pocket. It's in the pocket. James says over there in James 1.13, Brother Mike, you, you, well, uh, you're not getting dementia, are you? You keep going to James 1.13 through 15. What's going on? Is Alzheimer's seeking in? No. Because all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished under every good work. Why are you going to John, uh, James 1.13? Well, one reason, because it's there. 
And another reason is because it is us. What are you saying, James? I have a few men. James? Many men. James! Most men. James! Every man! Every man is drawn away. Tell you what, if you don't think you got looks. Wait till the right thing is dangled in front of you. It's all right to be up in here like, I ain't got it. Testing sitting next to you saying, you got it. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticing. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Who is that talking about? U.S. And I'm not talking about the United States. I'm talking about us. What happened with you this morning when it came out of the pocket? Huh? This morning. I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm talking about this morning when something drug it out of the pocket. And you wanted to get it back in there, but it refused to go. Every man. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The first nine verses of 2 Timothy chapter 3 are dealing with that subject. Somebody, if you would, to hasten this lesson at all. Get a mic for Derek here. You got me, one. Derek, if you would, 2 Timothy 3, start at verse 1. But understand this. Paul is saying, he said, what? But What's that first word? But understand but this. But understand this. We need to understand. I ain't up here to try to look good. I'm up here to preach the truth. Amen. Because I got to give an account. See, this ain't like where you go home and do this and do that. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Paul said, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Solomon said that wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. But he said, in all thy getting, all thy getting, get what? Listen to what Paul is saying here. But understand this. Come on down. That in the last days, last days. will come uh, set in perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear for people. Now, when you look at this particular text, some might ask the question, was it the last days of the first century? Or is it talking about present? Since the first century, things have been getting worse. 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 In the last days, go ahead. For people will be lovers of self. Lovers of self. And utterly self-centered. Let me tell you something. There is the problem of pride. God hates pride. He does. I'm better than you. Let me tell you something. There's always somebody better. Somebody smart. Somebody strong. Somebody richer. Somebody better looking. Always. Oh, pride, the Bible says, goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Uh, 
I'm not, I talk about education a lot because I'm an educator. I feel sorry for these people who go to these Ivy League schools. I, I feel sorry for them. You say, well, why should you feel sorry for somebody that's going to be in the upper 1% of the economic bracket? Because the instruction leads them to arrogance, elitism, and pride. Do y'all hear me, students? Yes, Do you hear me? Where'd you go to school? I went to IU. Well, I, you know, I, I'm at Princeton. Okay, so. Graduate, Brother Mingo, and then die the next day. I, I got my diploma from Princeton. And then die the next day. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. You know, don't be arrogant. Don't. Don't be. Because God can still make a Solomon. Oh, yeah. He can, he can make a Solomon without them going to any school. God can make a Solomon. God can make a David. He can turn a shepherd boy into a soldier. God can make a Samson. He don't have to be in the gym. All he needs is God. You see, the biggest part of sin is pride. Pride. Pride is bad. Pride will never get you to where you want to go. That's all it, all it is is a sickness. Here's a man full of pride, able to buy the best meals, sits down at a place, orders the best meal, costing two or three hundred dollars. Just past the man on the corner with a cardboard sign saying, hungry, please feed me anything to do. Here's the man that goes into the restaurant, gets the best meal, forgets to pray, and chokes to death on it. Chokes to death on it. Here's a poor man eating a hot dog. Gives God praise. Enjoys it. Got them chips. Got that Coca-Cola. Thankful. He's outside. He's not in the restaurant. Nobody in a white apron with a napkin over the shoulder. Sir, is there anything else? Can I get you some more? No, no, this guy's outside. He gives God thanks and praise. And enjoys what he has. You see, pride. Is going to get us all. A brother that may know more scriptures or the meanings than anybody else or other people, don't take no pride. You know why? Let me tell you why. To whom much is given, much is required. You know, then you are expected to do it. Don't pontificate with no. Do it. And don't come short. Do it. Do it. Don't boast about what you know. Because in the, in the end, to him to know, y'all yeah, yeah, know it, to him to know to do right and not do it, the Bible says to him that is sin. See, I realize if I write a paper, it ain't just about putting words on paper. God is saying, you have shown that you know something. I'm expecting you to do it. You cannot hide 
and say, well, Lord, I'm just writing. Well, the very fact that you're writing is indicative that there is something you're putting on the paper that you know. God is saying, if you know it, I expect you to do it. Oh, yeah. Ain't no excuses for nobody. Let me move on down here. Look at that clock. That hand is just moving. You know, there's another thing. In verses 3, 4, we find that there's a long list of sinful characteristics. Brother, go ahead and read 3 and 4 for me. They will be without natural human affection. No affection. Cal. Wait a minute. This is natural human affection. This ain't something you get from a book. This is natural. It's in us. When my grandson runs up that little hallway up to me, you know what he does? Naturally, he runs up, he runs up and hugs my leg. That's natural. Natural. Come on down. Uh, callous and inhuman. Callous means hard. Hard. There is no ease. Everything is hard. Come on down. Relentless. Relentless. Always. Always. They don't take no time. They're relentless. With evil. Come on down. Admitting of no truce or appeasement. Come on. They, I don't want a truce. You can't appease me. I'm after you. And that's it. I'm going to make life hard for you. I'm going to track you down. I'm going to persecute you. These are the attitudes of people of this age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the only way I'm going to like you, you got to do something for me. Now, if you can't do nothing for me, then it's a, you know, it's something else. Come on down. They will be slanderers. Slanderers. False accusers. False accusers. Troublemakers. Let me tell you something. Don't let nobody intimidate you by telling you, I know you, I knew you before you were converted. Well, that's all right. I ain't going to fall down because of that. That's not going to intimidate me. The big question is, do you know me now? Huh? Do you know me now? Yeah! But the thing is, the way I was, you still are. You still are, but I have been changed. Paul said in Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable in the sight, which is your reasonable, your spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. You knew me. But guess what? I've been born again. I've been born again. They don't tell me if I don't come back to be the way you are now that we can't be friends. I'm down with that. I'm good with that. Yeah. I don't need to be your friend if it means behaving like you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, be, be followers of me as I am of Christ. Oh, yeah. Come on down, Brother Derek. Intemperate and loose in morals. Intemperate. In other words, no self-control. No self-control. There's no stop sign in you. Some say, you know, stop. You know what? Pump the brake before you do something that you're going to regret. Everything looks good. But when you cross that line, the ugliness appears. See, that's why the law is as it is. And Paul writing to the church at Rome said something in chapter 7. He said, is the law sin? No, it is not sin. He says, I would not have known 
lust except by the law. What did the law say? Thou shalt not covet. Paul said, but sin that it might appear sin working death by that which is good, that sin might be exceedingly sinful. Oh yeah. The devil's got sin looking good. Oh man. You ain't had no pleasure until you've done that. And when we buy into that lie, what happens? We cross the line. And when we cross the line, you know what happens? The devil steps back. And then what happens? The law steps forward. What does the law do? It condemns. You know the difference between the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death? is that the Mosaic law condemned on the first infraction. It, it, it didn't allow you to do multiples. The first time, bam, it's got you. Paul said the law was what weak through the flesh. Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. You see, come on down there. I, it's, 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 it's not giving me time. Come on down. And loose in morals and conduct, uncontrolled. What, what kind of morals? Loose in morals. Loose. Loose. Back in the 70s, you know what the saying was? Most of y'all don't know. What was it? If it feel good, do it. Y'all remember that song by Isaac Hayes, don't you? Do your thing. Y'all like, what is he talking about? But you know what I'm talking about. Do your thing. You see, that's loose morals. When a brother cannot give sister respect, and a sister cannot give a brother respect, that's loose morals. That's loose morals. You know? Loose morals. What are you doing? You are showing yourself as to what you are. That's all you're doing. Come on down, brother. Uh, loose in morals and conduct. Yeah. Uncontrolled and fierce. Yeah. Haters of good. Haters of good. Come on down. They will be treacherous. Betray treacherous. Betrayers. Come on. Rash and inflated with self-conceit. Come on. They will be lovers of sensual pleasures. Oh, my goodness. Rather than lovers of God. Rather than lovers of God. For although they hold oh, the form. Hold it right there. I want to make a point clear. Give me Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5. I'll actually make it verse number 4. I want to show you something. But then I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All right. Hebrews chapter 13 and give me verse number 4. L let me tell you something. This sexual immorality has got to stop. I'm serious. Don't worry about messing with the Constitution of the United States. Well, at least I didn't offend the Constitution. Guess what? When you leave this life, the Constitution will matter nothing. You know what the law says, James? It says as long as the people are of age and it is consensual, then sex is all right. Brother Martin, why are you talking about sex this morning? Because the Bible talks about it. Well, Mark, Mike, you just put it in the paper because everybody don't get the paper. As long as two people agree, married or not, it's okay. That's the law. Because the police, they say, well, look, how old are you? 18. Was it an agreement? Yep. See you. Yeah, no, I'm right. Come on now. 
Marriage is to be held in honor among marriage all. Marriage is to be held in honor. Go ahead. Among all. Among all, come on. That is regarded as something of great value. And, come on. And the marriage bed undefiled. The marriage bed. You see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Please point the page. For every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. First Corinthians chapter 10. What else may be said of fornication that in one day God killed three and twenty thousand? Now, if that don't scare you, I mean, you dead already. If somebody's about to commit fornication, say, hey, man, before you do this, I just one thing I want you to do. What's that? Get a Bible. A what? A Bible. And do what with it? Turn to, turn, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And? And read. What? That in one day, yeah, God killed 23,000 people. It wasn't by a tsunami. It wasn't by a tornado or a cyclone or an earthquake or a volcano. It was by God. And, and what happened? 23,000 people were killed for what? What you are about to do. Is that all right, y'all? Should I recant and just say, well, I don't want to talk about that. I shouldn't talk about that. Let me tell you something that's real. So don't let nobody come hitting on you saying it's all right. Don't go Marvin Gay on them. You know, when I say don't go Marvin Gay on them, what I'm talking about is when he was talking in that song. That's <laughs> <He's so dead. laughs> Brother Jackson. <laughs> Jackson, let's get it on. <laughs> That's all right, brother. You just being real. That's all right. You know, I would have come up with it, but I, I just I just bring it out. <laughs> let's get it on. Come on down, brother. We got a we got a race now. By immortality or by sexual sin. Let me tell you something. Paul said, first Corinthians chapter seven, he said this, verse one. He said, now concerning the things whereunto you wrote me, it is not good for a man to touch a woman. Now, he didn't mean like this. He was talking sexually. He says, nevertheless, he says, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own. I didn't hear that. Right. Mistress. Right. Girlfriend. Right. Lady, right. there you go. Yeah, and every wife her own. Yeah. Let me tell you something. That's God's law. It's not something I'm inserting in there. Now, anything other than that, mm-hmm. every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own. There you go. Everything other than that, we'll take it to James chapter 1, 13 to 15. I'm just preaching. Amen. There are angels in here. There are angels in here. So why should I preach something to please somebody? Well, I, I escaped that sermon. Yeah. All right, come on back to, 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 to Timothy. Yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Start at verse number 10. Number 10. Now you have diligently followed my example, that is, my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, Patience, love, steadfastness. Pers- read through 12. Read through 12. 
persecutions and suffering, such as happened to me at Antioch, yes. at Laconium, and at Lystra. Okay, what, keep going. What persecutions I endured, but the Lord rescued, rescued me from them all. Okay, now let me tell you something. This section of the chapter is dealing with suffering, verses 10 through 12. Paul's patience was a real example of Christianity. Paul faced many problems. Let me tell you something. All who live godly, you're going to have problems. You're going to suffer persecution. It ain't going nowhere. You stand for God, you're going to suffer for it. Huh? Paul said in Acts chapter 20, he said, now I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city that binds and afflicts abide me. They're waiting for me. But he went on to say, but none of these things move me. Now, because you're going to face persecution, does that mean you're going to stop being a Christian? You're going to stop being godly? Because I tell you what, if you're going to stop being godly because of the persecutions, when you die, then I want you to look at Luke 16, 19 to 31 to look at that persecution that rich man had. When he begged Abraham to send Lazarus, that Lazarus may dip his finger into water. Do you understand the imagery of that? Can I hear you to something right quick? That when you get to that part of Luke chapter 16, you are dealing with disembodied spirits. Disembodied spirits. Did the rich man have a tongue? No. Did Lazarus have a finger? No. But what was going on here? The misery was so great that the rich man was going through that he was seeking just the very minimal of comfort that did not exist. And guess what? He wasn't in the lake of fire. If that kind of misery exists at death and you're not yet in the lake of fire, what awaits you then? Come on down. Indeed, all who delight in pursuing righteousness and are determined to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be hunted and persecuted because of their faith. I want to live a godly life. And if I'm hunted and persecuted because of my faith, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with it because the Bible teaches me that which is seen is temporal, but what is not seen is eternal. And this, this persecution right now worketh what? An eternal something. Weight of glory. So what if somebody lie on you, talk about you? You know, they did it to Christ. He said the servant is not greater than the master. We don't have to go along to get along when that going along to get along causes you to leave the word of God. Come on down. Uh, but evil men and imposters. Evil men will do. They will wax worse and worse. Paul said, uh, David said, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now standeth in the way of sinners. Now sitteth in the seat of the scornful. For his delight is in the law of God, and in it doth he meditate. And makes you think about the deal, don't you? Y'all don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. You know that music by the deal? D-E-E-L-E. -E -E. I only think of you on two occasions. What's that? Day and night. I see you back there, my, sister, but my smile is like, yeah. I didn't know if he was whispering or what. But that, what are you saying? <laughs> that the word of God ought to be up here, day and night. Why? Because it go along with what Paul was saying, that we ought to pray without. Because trouble is always, let me tell you something, y'all already know. 
Come on down, bro. But evil men and impostors will go on from bad to worse. Come on. Deceiving and being deceived. Come on. But as for you. As for you. Continue in the things that you have learned and of which you are convinced, holding tightly to the truth. Don't leave the faith. Don't quit. When a brother preaches or teaches you the truth, you stay with it. You stay with it. Knowing from whom you learn them. In other words, brothers and sisters, we've got to be the kind of examples that people can follow. If your example is short, somebody's always following you, right or wrong. What kind of example are you leading? They, I mean, they, they, they're, they're looking at you. If you ain't there, they went, well, where is they at? Always looking at you. Now, don't drag them to where you yourself don't want to be. And let me tell you something else. I'm almost done. Uh, I asked you, what, 12, 22? I'm watching that. Right now. now, look. We got to be careful as to how we treat each other. Amen. You know why I'm saying this? Jesus said, it is better for a man to have a millstone tied about his neck and cast into the depth of the sea than to offend one who believes in me. Could you imagine a giant stone tied around your neck and cast in the sea? You going down, you try, you know you can't come up. Water is getting in your mouth, in your lungs. Your eyes are rolling back in your head. Jesus said, that's better than for me to deal with you. Now, you know what? That's a bad thing to have a millstone tied about your neck. We better be careful as to how we treat each other. Matthew chapter 25 says what, Brother Martin? Jesus said, inasmuch as you've done it to the least of mine, you have done it to me. Oh, yeah. And you know what? We might not be keeping a journal. God is. The Bible says, your works shall follow after. Come on down. We're going to wrap it up. Knowing from whom you learn them. Yes. And how from childhood you have known the sacred writings. From the youth. Mama had taught y'all. Don't come saying, now you know what? Commandment is still in effect out of the Old Testament, out of Deuteronomy 19. <coughs> Honor your mother, or Deuteronomy 55, rather, that your days may be prolonged upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, my aunt, in the 1950s. Made me re memorize the Ten Commandments. In the 1950s. That was the first command with promise. Is that command still in effect? Should mother and father be honest? Absolutely. What can happen if they are not honest? You end up with a short life. Children, don't you know your mother and father are a gift? They're a gift. You know why? The Bible says we brought nothing into this world and we shall carry nothing out. Were it not for your mother and father, there would be no you. If they got something godly to tell you, listen. Because if you reject what they've got to say of God, you're not only rejecting your parents, you're rejecting God. Yeah. 
He said that your days, not the parents, your days may be lengthened. Everybody don't get into their 70s. Come on down, though. Then he goes into, I'll finish up. The Bible says that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Yes. Paul said, whereby when you read, you may understand my mysteries and the mis my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. What are you saying, Paul? That what I know, I know, because it is the Holy Spirit working through me to know. Because Paul would, he would say, you know what? I didn't know none of this stuff <laughs> before I was converted. I didn't know none of this stuff while I was out there persecuting the Christians. I, I, I know it now. How, Paul, the Spirit? I know it now. Follow the word of God. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to stop right there. The, the best thing you can do is be obedient to the will of God. You have someone here today. You have not been baptized for the remission of sin. The remission of sin is to have your sins forgiven by whom? God. What does God do? He clears the record. All your past sins cleared, justified because of the blood of Christ. The gospel is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 4, verse 25, he was delivered for offenses, raised again for our justification. Romans 5 and 1, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom also we have access into this grace wherein we stand. Paul writing the church of Rome, Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them where in Christ Jesus. How do we get in Christ Jesus? We are baptized into him. Galatians 3.27. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe he died, buried, rose again, the third day according to the scripture? Are you willing to repent of your sins? What does that mean? That means to change your mind as to the stuff you've been doing. Jesus died on the cross for the stuff you've been doing. All the pleasures, all the sin. He paid it. He paid the cost. God laid on him Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, the iniquity of us all. Are you willing to confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God? Are you? When asked the question, are you willing to do that? The answer is yes. And the next question is this. Are you willing to be baptized for the remission of sin? You, you mean, preacher, I got to go down in the water? Well, we, we, we can't dip you in air. We are already buried in air. And that's not baptism by water. But why do we have to be baptized in water? It's a command. Was Jesus ever baptized in water? John the Baptist baptized him. Why must we be baptized? It's a command. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Ephesians chapter 4, there's one baptism. What is that one baptism? Water. Peter said it in First uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 21, the last figure were baptism. We baptized how? Where was the ark in water? How do we, we, how do we get into Christ in water? Is water a burial? It's a burial. Because baptizo is the Greek word for baptism, which means to dip. To dip means to put under. You see, what we do is the spiritual side of what Jesus did. What do you mean? He died and was buried. We're in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And then he rose on the third day. We die, what? To the love and practice of sin. Uh, then what? We are buried in what? Water. Then we rise to walk in newness of life. So there is a death, 
burial, and resurrection for us. But you know, that's not all. When we do that, there are two elements that happen. Number one, God forgives you of all your past sins. What does he wipe the slate clean? He says, your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And then he gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why the gift of the Holy Spirit? Because we cannot do the things of God without him. We can't. What do you mean? I was talking about this thing in my pocket earlier. You know? That sin want to come out. Holy Spirit may encourage me. But you don't want to do that. Put that back in your pocket. Put that back in your pocket. Be swift to hear. Slow to speak. Slow to walk. Put it back in your pocket. Leave that woman alone. You married? Yeah. Leave that woman alone. Why would you want to bring God's judgment on you? Is what you got not enough? Leave that woman alone. Put that back in your pocket. You know? Were it not for the Holy Spirit, this thing would be out all the time. Hey, babe, what's up? Aren't you mad? Yeah. But you know? You know? You, you ever hear that song, babe? You know? About the eagle and the dove. But what's that? If you can't be with the one you love, not that yet. You see, the Holy Spirit will help you to keep all that in your pocket. Ain't no eagle and dove flying together. <laughs> keep it in your pocket. You see, that's why we have the gift of the Spirit, to keep it in your pocket. You know? So you don't end up doing something going to end up doing. If you have anybody in this condition, why don't you come while we stand this up? Amen. 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 Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your mercy. Uh, don't forget again about the van. You know, we have no problem getting it back on the road. We just need volunteers and we just need to know who needs to be picked up. Yeah, we just need to know who needs to be picked up. And so without further ado, I turn the service to the hands of the doctor.